So now we have to talk about transport and how things get across the membrane. So there are two broad categories of transport. So there's passive transport and active transport. So passive transport, it can require you, it can happen by itself. Like you can put it in a test tube and a cell, artificial cell without any energy. And this can occur spontaneously without having to add heat or ATP or any other chemicals. Whereas active transport, that means that this can't occur by itself. Your cell needs additional help from some sort of energy source. So this is, these are the types of passive transport I want you to know for this class. So there's diffusion, and then uh, the role, I'll explain the high to low role later. And then there's facilitated diffusion, which is like a subtype of diffusion. And then osmosis, what happens that is there's a movement of water and active transport. So there are two broad categories. Actually, there is tertiary active transport, but that's like graduate med school level. So active transport, the two main types of active transport are primary active transport. And if you take in a cell biology, you know ATP. And then so primary active transport requires a chemical called ATP, whereas secondary active transport this rel relies on what we call a chemical gradient. So basically some difference in chemical concentration between different sides of the membrane. And endocytosis and end exocytosis. So here's my unofficial rule of thumb for physiology and especially pressures. And actually it's not, not just pressures, even things like concentrations or energy. This is a rule that especially when you get to fill one for two that can come in handy. So in physiology, things to move from high to low. So high concentrations of solutes to low concentrations of solutes. They tend to move from high pressure to low pressure, whether it's a gas, solid, liquid, and even solids, and even energy. So physiology, this is what tends to happen. So high something to low something. But in this case, we're going to talk about concentrations of things. And osmosis, it can be kind of tricky but I'll show you how this work rule also still works with osmosis because osmosis is a big, I think it's one of the big hurdles when you're first learning cell biology, you kind of, it might be tricky at first, but once you get it in your head pretty solid, then it, a lot of things fall into place. So what is diffusion? So diffusion is a type of passive transport, meaning that it can occur without any additional energy. So say you have, a, but here we have a space, I'm just showing you, a, a, pretend this is a room and all of a sudden you open something like so say this is like a bottle of scented oils or a diffuser or say someone brings in a box of pizza and they open the lid well what happens to that room eventually well that those molecules that has the scent that have the scent they're going to spread out across the room until they're no longer just concentrated in one area but they're going to try to evenly distribute throughout the room so diffusion is a simple, similar concept in your cell. So if you have a high concentration of some sort of solute in the cell, just by diffusion, it's going to try to spread out to where there's a roughly equal concentration and distribution of that molecule throughout the cell. So I like to think of it this way. So, I mean, I guess this still applies to our current situation, but say you have two rooms and one room gets really crowded well, what's going to happen to the rooms eventually? You want to kind of spread out, right? You want to social distance where it's kind of comfortable because, I mean, maybe some people like being crammed up, crammed against each other into a very cramped room, but eventually, on average, people are going to distribute pretty evenly across the space if you allow exchange between these two areas. So diffusion is kind of like that. It's like these chemicals finding their comfortable space where they're roughly evenly distributed throughout an area. So what's happening here? Well, where do we start with a high concentration? We had a high concentration of people here and a low concentration of people here. So what happens is that we have a movement from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. And actually I use the shorthand a lot because concentration is a pretty, has a lot of characters in it. And if you're taking chemistry, you'll see this notation as well. So I'm just saying this is a high concentration and low concentration. I know I'm kind of using it atypical, but this is my little shorthand. Now facilitated diffusion, it is still diffusion, but with a little help. So remember that your plasma membrane, most of it is phospholipids, but notice that there are other things embedded in the membrane as well. So with glucose, well, glucose, 
has to get in your cells somehow, right? So how can you m get glucose into your cells? Well, if it can't cross and diffuse by itself, you can give it additional help. So there's something called facilitated diffusion. So notice that in facilitated diffusion, you don't have a plain plasma membrane with only phospholipids. Now you have the special protein, and this protein is actually forming a little channel that allows you to exchange from the outside and go toward the inside. Now, in, at rest, your cells have more glucose on the outside than they do on the inside because they're always burning through their glucose stores and using up that energy. So you have a higher concentration of glucose on the outside, less concentration of glucose on the inside. But notice it's still moving high to low. So whenever you have that passive transport, you're always moving things from a high concentration to a low concentration of something. And that's what ha is happening with diffusion. So again, facilitated diffusion, the key difference is that it's not just a plain phospholipid membrane. You actually need the help of additional protein that helps to transport things. So I like to think of it like as like a turnstile. So the turnstile, like these turnstiles, you might have seen them, or do they still use them at the zoo? But if you've been to like other cities, like sometimes subways have that, or sometimes like other to allow one-way passage of something from one place one place to another. Well, do these need electricity? Is turnstiles don't need electricity? So this is why I kind of like to say this is like a facility diffusion. So yeah, aquaporins are also uh, help with facilitated diffusion across the membrane as well. So because they are going to follow, still follow the high to low rule. So say you have this turnstile and it allows thing movement back and forth, or it can even be things like say you, if you've seen like saloon doors or whatnot, they have lost some sort of passage. So there's some sort of door that allows movement from one way to another, but the door itself does not require energy. It's just by things moving from a high concentration to a low concentration that drives the movement. So what we have here is that these m people who are acting as molecules, they're trying to spread out to evenly across the space that they can move across. Still moves high to low, but now you just have additional thing to help a molecule across a plasma membrane and facilitate diffusion. So simple diffusion, there's no help, it's just something crossing the plasma membrane Facilitate diffusion, there's some sort of protein or something else helping that passage. Now, here is another example of facilitated diffusion. So remember that I said in the previous slide that things that have a hard time crossing the plasma membrane are molecules that have strong electrical charges, and ions have at least a plus or minus one electrical charge. Well, it's going to have a hard time crossing this hydrophobic part, and it's not going to be able to pass through the same channels like aquaporins or the glucose transporters. So say we have all the sodium ions, what they need is their own special transporter and protein. So ion channels and ion channels, sometimes they can be exclusive to one ion, sometimes they can allow multiple similar ions through, but what they allow is that now you know, if you have an ion and its respective ion channel, it can pass through this plasma membrane without being interfered with with that hydrophobic area of the plasma membrane. So are they a type of integral proteins? Yeah, so they are integral proteins because they span the plasma membrane. They're embedded in the membrane. So integral is when they're basically stuck in the membrane. And yes, these channels, these ones that are important and transporters are important to facilitate the fusion, they are integral. Peripheral means that they're attached, but they're not embedded in this plasma membrane. Yeah, so facilitated diffusion, so yeah, integral has to pass from one side and reach the other side. Now, facilitated diffusion, again, they cannot pass by themselves through the phospholipid bilayer by themselves, and typically, in most cases, it's due to problems crossing that hydrophobic tails of a phospholipid. But transport proteins, these allow a shortcut and they allow uh, they allow the water soluble, or not, I shouldn't say water soluble, but they allow space for these solutes to travel from one side to another by bypassing that hydrophobic area. So again, this is facilitated fusion. It's not active transport because it still has to follow that high to low concentration. So if a cell that, say something like glucose, you can have a high concentration of glucose on one side and a low concentration inside the cell, 
if there's no glucose transporters, it can't cross. But once you add that glucose transporter, then it can finally cross.